Broadcasting live from the Business Radio X studios in Atlanta, Georgia, it's time for Atlanta Business Radio, spotlighting the city's best businesses and the people who lead them. Lee Cantor here, another episode of Atlanta Business Radio, and this is going to be a fun one. I got with me the original co-host of Atlanta Business Radio, Miss Amy Otto, and she is now with Virtual Med Staff. Welcome, Amy. Good morning, Lee. Yeah, it's good to be back. I've missed this. I definitely miss seeing you more often, and wow, I miss seeing a lot of people right now, Lee. <laughs> Pretty much everybody, except your family. Um, how has this COVID-19 crisis affected uh, virtual med staff? Well, well, uh, we've been busy. We've been very busy. It's interesting. Um, my mom used to always tell her friends I was a pharmaceutical rep, like, for years. I've never been a pharmaceutical rep. For 20 years, she's been telling her friends that that's what I do. Um, I was a diagnostic testing specialist for a while. Nope, I was still pharmaceutical rep. Well, she could not grasp what telemedicine was until now. So my mom actually saw her cardiologist via telemedicine and she's like, can you believe this? I can see the doctor on your sister's iPad. I'm like, yeah, mom, that's what I've been doing. It was, it was kind of comical, but you know, I think a lot of people have not been very quick to embrace telemedicine and now it's really the only way to be able to flatten the curve, to keep people in their homes and keep people away from the emergency rooms. For the basic things, um, and and really try to treat patients virtually. So it's been great for our business, definitely. Now, uh, let's educate the listener a little bit about telemedicine. Is telemedicine only a visual uh, kind of uh, tool, or can it be just the phone? Because most people, I would think, have some familiarity with like calling a tele nurse or calling and getting some kind of basic medical. Uh, advice. Is this differ kind of dramatically from that? So there's a lot of different ways telemedicine can be um, articulated or engaging with the patient. Um, Storing forward is, is a way, you know, a lot of folks will communicate with their primary care physician via email. And so that is actually one method of telecommunicating with your physician. Uh, sometimes it's just audio. Um, in the case of virtual med staff, it's audio and video. Um, and the reason for that is that a lot of it has to do with the laws and regulations, which have recently been relaxed in a huge way um, to encourage telemedicine, uh, both on a federal and state level. Um, but really, it could be storing forward. It can be audio only or audio visual. Um, so uh, several different ways to conduct uh, telemedicine visits. And then with your firm, you're working primarily with doctor's offices or hospitals or both? Both. You know, we work primarily with hospitals. However, that has evolved into a big need for outpatient clinic coverage. And our largest client on the outpatient side is uh, for psychiatry with Kaiser Permanente. Um, And now actually reaching patients in their home as well. So using their platform, our doctors can see patients in in any of the 50 states. we usually develop a small panel given the region of the hospitals, and there will be several dedicated physicians on a panel to reach those specific hospital systems that are um, contracted with us. So, yeah, we are actually in 38 states now, and what dictated that has really been the telemedicine laws. There are certain states that just do not reimburse for telemedicine, and certain states that have not embraced parity. So, Uh, We have really uh, focused on those that have been um, looking at telemedicine in a positive aspect and and really regulating it um, for the patient. You know, it's a good thing for the patient to be able to see their doctors. And um, and in rural areas where there's a huge shortage, sometimes it's the only way to see a specialist. So, um, yeah, looking to expand. And this has been great news for the telemedicine industry for sure. Um, a lot of those restrictions and regulations have been relaxed, especially on the federal level. Um, reimbursement's always been an issue for telemedicine, and now they've added an additional 80 or 90 um, codes for reimbursement. So that's been wonderful. Um, so Medicare, uh, the federal level, has it has engaged um, telemedicine and really uh, put it in a positive light 
Um, and then, of course, it goes down to the state level for Medicaid and some of the commercial payers, and that is all state specific. But even there, um, I think 48 states have made a statement regarding telemedicine and the expansion of the services, increasing reimbursement um, in the use of just the phone and waiving of copayments. Um, so a lot of positive moves in the area of telemedicine for sure. Now, from a patient standpoint, um, the interaction might be kind of unusual in that they're used to having a human kind of look at them and touch them. How does the doctors kind of handle some of the diagnostic challenges that come with not being, you know, touching them and not being in the same room? That's a great question. You know, our physicians are actually trained in website manner. And what that means is uh, they're trained in how to really try to break through that barrier of the screen. Um, a lot of additional eye contact. Um, our physicians, we send them two monitors. So they're looking at the patient's chart on one and they're uh, looking at the patient on the other. Um, from the patient standpoint, um, really all it takes is one time for somebody to engage in, in that interaction with the physician and uh, really gotten positive feedback across the board. You, we would think that maybe it's just the younger generation or those in their you know, 20s and 30s that would embrace the technology. But what we found is that even the geriatric population is used to FaceTiming grandchildren and they're used to screens. So believe it or not, um, patients are embracing it more widely than you may think. Um, and especially for psychiatry, that's one area that we've really grown is in telepsychiatry. And, and the reality is the doctor doesn't ever touch the patient anyway. And in the small towns, we're finding that they'll, a, a patient would be more apt to seek services from telepsychiatry rather than someone within their small town because they'd be spilling their guts to somebody that they may be sitting next to at their son's football game or somebody that they make it a search with. So um, really the telecommunication aspect of, of medicine is, is going to become even wider um, embraced as, as the epidemic here continues and people can't get out for prescription refills and they'll be you know, forced to use telemedicine. So um, it's, a, it's a great time, great time for our business, a great time for Jackson Healthcare in general. Um, to really showcase how we can live out our values, which is growth, wisdom, and others first. Um, I know Jackson Healthcare has been placing nurses and doctors all over the country to help in the hot spots. And so really giving us an opportunity to shine and to show communities how we can help. So it's been, it's been a great time for us. Now, you mentioned um, the psychiatry. I would think that that's a kind of an easier barrier because like you said, they're not usually touching their patients and it's just talking and it does create a comfort and maybe some anonymity like you were saying that they're not driving up and parking their car in front of the psychiatrist's office and maybe their neighbor will see or you kind of eliminate all of those kind of um, reasons not to go. Now, are you finding that uh, this has created an uptick in actual people going, or is this something that now that they have access to it, it's maybe too early to tell if this is increasing the number of people who should have should be getting some help uh, that are actually getting help? That's an interesting question too, because I guess we're in what week five of. Uh, COVID-19 and, and on Fridays, I give my team at virtual med staff an update. So I've had to keep up with the statistics and, and really trying to encourage individuals to understand how telehealth and the flexibility does help to flatten the curve by keeping people at home. So our site visits have been way down, Lee. And I, I, that's concerning to me because, um, we kind of know what those volumes are and when we see them lower, what's going to happen right about now, this week in Georgia, as a matter of fact, is that a lot of folks will be running out of their prescriptions. And it's it's going to be interesting to see how the mental health um, afterlash, you know, the backlash of this, because we've actually talked to some psychiatrists in, in Georgia, our accounts, and they talk about, um, you know, instead of 
post-traumatic stress syndrome. Right now, they feel like there's a lot of pre-traumatic stress syndrome. And as the weeks go on and the bills keep coming in and they're unable to be paid and the um, unemployment rate skyrockets and as the, the conditions get worse and worse, those um, mental health needs are going to increase. So we do anticipate an uptick um, of psychiatry. We've also seen a reduction in neurology. Um, we do a lot of stroke coverage and general neurology and a lot of emergency departments. Um, I think folks are just really afraid to go. Um, and in some cases, there's designated spots for uh, the COVID-19 patients and, and they're outside of the emergency room. But um, overall, our regular numbers have decreased, but the number of hospitals and clinicians and individuals contacting us saying we need help um, has increased. I um, have one large client in Illinois, and um, they have, have some of their healthcare workers have uh, COVID-19, so we've had to increase their coverage. Uh, so I think as the weeks go on, we're going to hear more and more of that. And it's also kind of stretched our imagination and our ability to provide some other specialties, um, pulmonology, infectious disease, some of those that, um, you know, our clients really need right now just to get them through these um, months of heavy volume for uh, the virus. So um, definitely has been an exciting time for us. It's allowed us the opportunity to partner with some of our sister companies at Jackson Healthcare and really um, come together to provide some great resources for our clients and in the communities we serve. Now, walk me through what it's like if a hospital, maybe they were kind of dabbling with uh, telemedicine before, but they weren't really kind of embracing it and as kind of going all in and, and they want to kind of onboard and work with virtual med staff. What does that look like? Do they have to buy a lot of new equipment? Is it, is it really cumbersome um, to, you know, tie it into their IT and all that stuff? Like walk me through what it looks like if somebody wants to partner with virtual med staff. Sure. So depending on the program and whether it's like, obviously stroke has to be a very quick response time because that window in which you can give a patient TPA is very small to be able to reverse the effect of the stroke. So uh, programs like stroke really do require, um, you know, high-definition camera, a microphone. It requires somebody within the hospital system, too, to be a telepresenter, a nurse that has experience with the telemedicine equipment. But we've seen everything from elaborate robots to very simple uh, homemade systems, which might even include just a laptop on a cart. Um, so it really just depends. Um, but we work with whatever they have because typically our physicians are making their notes directly into the EMR system, uh, which is preferred, you know, so the coordination of care and all the data uh, regarding that patient is in one place. Um, so it definitely helps with the collaborative care model. Uh, so we see it again, anything as simple as a laptop or a an iPad to something more sophisticated. Um, and with some of these regulations being relaxed, uh, HIPAA has always been a huge issue. And so it used to be that you had to actually have a, a HIPAA compliant connection and there were a lot of regulations around that. But um, more recently, that has been lifted um, to include uh, Skype and FaceTime. Uh, we've already been using Zoom and another uh, product called Video, V-I-D-Y-O. But, um, yeah, a patient can be in their home and could FaceTime their physician. So it's um, it's been great having the relaxation of a lot of these laws and regulations. Um, however, we do deem them temporary. So, for instance, a client has a need. Uh, we find the physician. We can exercise that position to, to um, practice very quickly, given the relaxation of the regulations for licensing. Um, you know, the, um, the federal government relaxed the licensing component, so allowing a physician uh, across state lines to practice. So while we would be going ahead and taking advantage of that by placing the physician in this program, side by side, we would go through the normal licensing and credentialing process. Um, so the DEA has lifted a lot of restrictions as well um, so that we're able to take advantage of the relaxation of these 
policies to be able to quickly treat uh, patients in areas of need. Um, so long-winded answer to your question about technology, but it really just depends. It doesn't have to be anything too sophisticated. And then from the patient side, it just, they probably have the equipment at their house. It might be a smartphone or an iPad in order to communicate with the physician, right? Yes, exactly. Um, And for primary care and and things that are basic, um, you know, eye infection, ears, nose, throat, those types of visits are are very easy to do um, via telemedicine. Uh, The ones that require actual touching of the patient it really is important if we're in a hospital uh, environment that we have a liaison, we have somebody on the ground that's um, you know, taking the computer from patient to patient and really um, we help with those workflows as part of our project management um, just to make sure we're, we're meeting their needs and working as efficiently and effective as possible. Um, but with the more current relaxation of these laws, yes, the patient in their home um, could use their smartphone. But like you said, there might be situations where that patient might have to go to a virtual med staff partner, uh, physician group or hospital. And even if they don't have that specialist, they might be able to connect to a specialist elsewhere. Exactly. Yes. Um, And neurology really has been a big push for us out of need. We had a lot of clients that we were doing telepsychiatry and, and I mean, neurologists, there is a huge shortage of neurologists in our country. And so to be able to reach uh, the more rural areas in the rural hospitals um, to have a, a telestroke program or a teleneurology program is, is huge. Um, you were asking a question about how open-minded are people to telemedicine? I have a, a group in Nebraska I've been working with for quite some time, and we finally got their contract signed. And uh, the CFO I've been working with has been a huge proponent of telemedicine because she worked in telemedicine at the previous hospital she was at. And everybody's been you know, pushing back, pushing back. No, this isn't what we want to do. And, and she was telling me the story that, now she's like the hero. <laughs> she said, I feel like I've got a cape on and I'm at the edge of this cliff and we're all about to jump. And the only thing that's going to save us is this parachute called telemedicine. And I was like, okay, I love that. You know, she's been this big cheerleader for the program. And now people realize the necessity and realize how important it is to be able to expand lines of specialty. And most of all, I mean, our the geographic location of you and your family should not dictate the quality of your health care. We've got a lot of farmers in the Midwest and across the United States that work so hard, and the closest facility for health care might be an hour and a half away, and the closest area for a specialty might be four hours away. So really being able to expand those specialty services is just huge when it comes to quality patient care. Right. It's it's one of those things where the technology has been there maybe in education where you can take a course at an Ivy League school, you know, from a, you know, top instructor in the world, uh, you know, in your on your laptop, but you couldn't see, you know, the top physician in the world <laughs> for need, even though you would think that it's a similar activity, like it's not that dramatic of a leap to go from a professor teaching a class to a physician kind of giving you information. Yes. I mean, it's so true. We have seen it in the education system for quite some time, and there's so many benefits. Um, I mean, we see it right now just with the the state of our country and everybody having to social distance. Um, This is amazing how people have continued to be able to work from home and conduct their business and, We'd still be able to see each other via Zoom or you know, whatever format they're using. And it's a it's an interesting time right now. And I, I think the one area that I have probably the greatest concern right now is just the mental health implications. Um, we have started to talk to some larger employers that have on-site clinics. Um, and talking to them about how bringing in you know, behavioral health will help. 
uh, from a claims perspective and save them money. Um, and you know, the more recent statistics I've been seeing from Mental Health America and the National Alliance on Mental Illness is it's just gut wrenching to think of the toll that this is going to take on individuals and you know 57.8 million Americans are already living with a mental disorder. Um, they anticipate that will be up anywhere from 38 to, to 40 percent um, due to the quarantining. And those with small children, um, even higher warranted um, diagnosis of trauma-related mental health disorder because these are trying times. And so we really are preparing ourselves for an uptick in uh, mental health needs um, via telemedicine and you know, long after things go back to quasi-normal, um, I think those mental health implications will will still be there. So, All right. Sadly, that's going to really, be the gift that keeps on giving. Well, when this thing's uh, over with, because, it, like you said, you can't just you know kind of have what I think 16 million unemployed people in the last few weeks and not think there's some mental toll that's taking um, and to not have access to care is, you know, you're just making a bad situation worse. Exactly. And the FQHCs, the smaller federally qualified health centers, they are getting some additional money specifically tagged for telemedicine, which has been huge um, because there's, gosh, there's, I think maybe 1,400 or more. There's so many patients that rely on these FQHCs for their health care. Um, and there might be more than 1,400, but it's like more than 30 million individuals are seeking their health care at these community health centers. So you know, we've also been reaching out to them and, and letting them know that uh, we're here to help. Um, we like to try to help um, specific companies and, and clinics to maximize their own resources first because a psychiatrist is expensive. And so if that's social workers or clinical workers, we help with a, a workflow. So it's a triage system. We're seeing the patients that are more severe that need to see a psychiatrist or need medication management um, and, you know, incorporating their resources that they have internally with the program. So, um, yes, the, the mental health needs, I think, are going to far exceed what we're, we're seeing now for sure. Well, if somebody the other wants- thing, Lee, is, is, is the mental health of these employees. Like, I'm hearing that from hospitals I'm talking to. Our current clients are saying, you know, we're worried about our own employees. I mean, they're, many of them are sleeping in makeshift accommodations at the hospital, and they're working long, long hours in this extremely stressful environment. And, you know, so I think a lot of healthcare workers are really going to need assistance when all of this is over. Right. And people don't realize that the healthcare worker that's out there on the front lines battling, a lot of times they're not even going back to their family because they're, they're kind of quarantined from their own family on top of uh, the work they're doing at the, at the healthcare facility. So there's a lot of pressure on them coming from multiple fronts. So having access to quality um, kind of mental health care is critical for everybody. Gosh, exactly. Um, and the Center for Connected Health Policy was recently uh, talking about the funding that's being uh, distributed to FQHDs and to hospitals. I know they've sped up some Medicare payments to certain hospitals just to try to help bridge the gap. But, I mean, we, these hospitals are losing millions of dollars daily. Um, it's, it's really sad to see so many of these um, workers being furloughed because all of the elective surgeries have been uh, rerouted. I mean, they're not, they're not doing elective surgeries. If it's not essential or necessary, they're waiting um, because of COVID-19. So that's a lot of, a lot of lost revenue. Um, and one hospital up north tell me that it was upwards of $20 million a day wow. in lost revenue. Yeah. Yeah. So. It'll be really interesting to see what the upcoming months hold and, you know, in the areas where, where we can help and be of service are those where, uh, you know, patients can either stay in their home or 
they're going to a clinic and we might be even substituting for the physician that would typically see the patient that now has um, been compromised due to the virus or a family member has been compromised. So um, the good thing, though, is I, I do hear a lot of collaboration um, within the world. Like A lot of scientists are collaborating. Um, Europe and the U.S. are sharing data on how the virus has been affecting individuals and and the antibodies, and they're working towards vaccines. And gosh, over 70 companies are working towards a vaccine. So hopefully, um, something will will come up and shake loose, and uh, just be interesting to watch how the problem does unfold. Well, it must be rewarding to be part of the solution uh, for you to really be able to have a tool that can really help these uh, hospitals. And the individuals, you know, help flatten the curve, number one, but also create additional kind of opportunities for these um, medical facilities uh, to kind of still serve more and more people despite the challenges that are in front of them. It really has been. It's been a good feeling to be able to reach out to our clients. And and more than anything, I've just been listening a lot um, and, and being a strategic partner with them, and I always tell them I'm their partner in preparedness because who knows what tomorrow will bring. And uh, you know, I I've been checking in with my my regular clients every Monday, and just just to check on them and see do they need to talk? Do they do they need additional coverage in in an area where we might already have positions in place where we can you know increase due to the need or demand, um, or due to you know hospital staff either being furloughed or sick. So. Uh, it is. It's, it's been a, a, an exciting time and an interesting time. Um, I've kind of been serving as the liaison for our team because there's so much information coming at us from so many different sources that, um, you know, some of these fact sheets are 127 pages long. Right. <laughs> Nobody's going to read that. No. So I've been trying to give the cliff note versions and you know, really relying on some credible resources, uh, you know, the Johns Hopkins tracking, the world of meter data, data, and then looking at, you know, for the local, the Georgia Department of Public Health has some great statistics. Um, yeah, I, I just pulled it up this morning and it by county, it looks like there's about 12,550 cases in Georgia, and there's been 442 deaths, um, with the highest counties being Fulton and Doherty County. And there's actually been more deaths in Doherty County, 72, and there's been 50 in Fulton. And I talked to a friend that's intimately involved in some boots on the ground work at, uh, in Albany in Doherty County, and many of these cases were actually linked back to a funeral where um, a group of individuals, they were all at the same funeral. So it's just got to practice the social distancing as painful as it is for some and just really try to do everything we can to to stop the spread. Yeah, that is, uh, that's one of those things where it, uh, we really have to be mindful of this, importance of staying apart so we can all kind of stay together after this thing's over. But it takes a lot of discipline for a lot of people to kind of say, you know what, I'm going to stay in the house. That's, it, it might be painful. It might disrupt my normal way of doing things, but that's what's got to be done for at least uh, a few for the next coming weeks. And if not months uh, to flatten this curve. Oh, Exactly. Exactly. Um, and it, it is hard. I mean, I'm a social person and I'm a hugger. You know that. <laughs> and it's it's been really strange. It feels so awkward to me to be talking to one of my neighbors from across the street or not petting their dog or not letting my dog play with other dogs. And, um, you know, having having adult kids home now to quarantine with me. It's it's um it's an interesting time, Lee, but wow, um, a time where I feel um, Jackson Healthcare and Virtual Med Staff can make a huge difference, and we're just here to listen. We're here to partner. We're here to help. Um, I love talking to individuals about COVID-19 and hearing their perspective and sharing what I know and and you know listening and learning because it truly is a, a time like uh, 
you, nobody could have ever imagined. And I mean, this is history. This is just unbelievable. And uh, definitely the social distancing and the quarantine is the way to go. So we'll keep on doing it, right, Lee? Absolutely. Until we get the the okay that it's okay, you know, we're, we're on the other side of this. But if somebody wanted to learn more and have a more substantive conversation about virtual med staff, what's the website? I know on the website, I'm sure has a bunch of material that they can read or listen to or watch to help explain how this works and how they can onboard. Absolutely. So it's virtualmedstaff.com and lots of links, um, some information, more recent information on COVID-19, We're publishing white papers as quickly as we can and just gathering information to be able to share and, and help others learn. Um, about what we do, and and we're just here to help, whether it's a community health center, a clinic, a hospital, and even, you know, there's employers that are looking to uh, really add resources for mental health and primary care even for their employees. So, um, yeah, we would love it if you contacted us, and if you want to know more, um, visit our website, and my email will probably be on uh, this link as well. Feel free to reach out me out to me um, directly. Good stuff. Well, Amy, thank you so much for sharing your story. You're doing important work and helping lots of people, and we appreciate you. Oh well, thank you, thank you, Lee. Good to talk to you today. All right, this is Lee Cantor. We will see you all next time on Atlanta Business Radio.